Hello and welcome, I'm JD, and today we're going to have a look at Garnet Squadron, which is one of the starter fleets for the OSP faction. So the Garnet Squadron consists of four monitors and two tugs. And effectively, this is split between the four monitors being your damage dealing vessels and the two tugs being your spotting vessels. So first off, we're going to have a look at the four monitors. Now, some of these have a little bits of crossover between them, so where they differ, I'll point that out, but I won't harp on it too much. So hopefully this video won't go too long. So first off, the four monitors have a C81 plasma cannon fitted in the front of the ship. With the C81 plasma cannon being the piece of OSP technology or the, the coil gun uh, in particular that fires the superheated plasma or the plasma, plasma ampules, the purple rounds that you'll see. And they strip the armor off the ANS ships which will then allow your smaller caliber weapons to do the damage. So they have a autoloader capacity of four, a recycle time of four seconds, so uh, four seconds between each shot, and then a reload time of 40 seconds between uh, those four shots uh, in sequence. One thing to know about the C81 plasma cannon is that it is a fairly slow moving projectile. So uh, unlike some of the other weapons that move quite quickly, smaller targets will be able to likely dodge some of these are shots, uh, even within bulk. However, uh, your larger ships, such as the heavy cruisers and the battleships on the ANS, uh, will actually take some of those rounds uh, if they try to turn and get out of the way. And it fires the 400 millimeter plasma ampule with a muzzle velocity of 600 meters per second, which uh, for reference, the HE fires at 900. Once you've stripped some of the armor off your opponents, then what you want to do is open up with your T30 cannons. The T-30 cannon mounted at the top and the bottom of each of the four monitor ship are grouped within one weapon group. And the T-30, as it says here, has an autoloader capacity of 16, the recycle time of one second in between each of those shots, and a reload time of 30 seconds. So uh, it'll be able to put out a lot more fire, especially two of them per ship, and then uh, eight in total across the four. Now the T-30 cannon comes with three different ammunition types. You have the HE shell, the HEHC, as well as the AP. Now, each of these will, are effectively used for something else. The AP shot is more for uh, armor penetration, but it'll have less component damage. The HE shot is probably your standard go-to shot uh, for, uh, for this particular type of uh, engagement. It'll have 30, 30 centimeters of armor penetration, a 45 degrees of component hit damage, uh, health damage, and a penetration depth of, and a penetration depth of 15 meters. The HEHC is an OSP uh, faction locked ammo type, and it differs from the HE shell by the fact that it has a lower armor penetration of eight centimeters, but its component damage is significantly higher, and so is its penetration depth. Here you can see the armor penetration is 30, eight on the HEHC, and then the component damage is 35 on HE and penetrates 15 meters and ex with an explosion radius of five. However, 70 HP damage, 30 penetration depth, and 10 um, explosion damage radius. So effectively what you want to do is when you're within range and you only have 7,200 meters compared to the 12,000 meters of the plasma ampules, is strip with the plasma ampules at long range whilst you move in with a close range weapons. And then once you're at 7,200, uh, probably engage with HE to start with. Once you've confirmed that the enemy shell uh, armor has been degraded enough, which the HEHC to take it down quickly. So each of these weapons on these ships are buffed by a different module. So we have ammunition elevators, which will increase our reload time. And then we also have rapid cycle cradles, which reduces the auto load time. So on the right hand side here, you can see that the recycle time for the T81 goes down one second. And we also increase the recycle time and the reload time, for the T30s. One thing of the Echo of Desmonda, which is different to all the other ships, is that it has an RF-44 pinpoint radar. So uh, a worse version of the Bullseye, it has a range of 6.5 kilometers. So once you get within uh, 6.5 kilometers, turn this on and your accuracy will increase. Until that time, you will have to rely on your other um, electronic sensors and radars. And we'll cover that in a second. Point defense, uh, you have a variety of point defense across these four ships, and they are designed to fly in tandem, and we'll go through the formation as well. So uh, on the central ship, you have some anti-missile missiles and some de um, chaff decoy. 
The Tasty Palms has the P60 Grazer point defense turret, which will require burst durations of two seconds. Once it's engaged and destroyed a target, regardless of whether it has any time remaining, uh, it'll then need to go into a full re cooldown time for five seconds. It's also supported by the top ship with two Pavis point defense turrets and some auto flak in the form of the Bastion point defense turret as well. So if you're flying these in formation, they'll all be able to support each other, all forward and all back. Uh, and the way that they've also been positioned all the way down and all the way up. So the weaker side is, in terms of point defense is engaging from the sides because only half of the point defense turrets of the group can actually engage an incoming threat. Onto DC teams, you have a reinforced DC locker, a large DC locker, and a rapid DC locker, giving you in total three restores and five repair teams and one flying repair team. That combined with the fair tankiness of this hull and the fact that some of its components are fairly uh, spread out with all these damage control teams and the restores, you should be able to remain in the fight pretty, pretty long. As long as you are sort of hanging around that 7,200 meter range, you don't probably want to go any closer than that. Uh, and then you also want to prioritize a few things for repair. But the power on each of these is fairly good, 82, 84, uh, anywhere between 84 and 77%. So you're not going over. So you can lose a little bit of power before you need to then uh, bring power modules back online. But with the, the main thing that you'll probably have knocked out is the C81, which you'll need to um, put a restore towards because the C81 is at the front of the ship and that's where frontal explosions, particularly if you're going forward directly into enemy contact, are going to be damaged. And also because you're going to be directing the nose of your ship towards the enemy in order to make use of it, as opposed to the turrets. So this will probably get knocked out at least once or twice and you've got enough restores to bring that back online. Uh, the rest of it should be okay in the, the game that I've played with this one. Uh, this was the one that uh, was damaged and destroyed the most. Otherwise, you have a variety of different radars. You have the Bulwark Huntress uh, with a search range of 10 kilometers, uh, fairly with, but with a fairly inaccurate positional and velocity error. And on the rest of your ships here, you have the Ithaca Bridgemasters, which have a range of 8.5 kilometers, a decent positional and velocity error. Uh, however, you do need to get sort of fairly close. So onto the two supporting ships, the two tugboat clippers here. Uh, these are designed to either run together or run in tandem. They will deploy together, um, as will the four ships will also deploy as one. Well. So the first one that we have is, actually, let me start with this one. The first one that we have here is a tugboat class clipper. It's got the Bloodhound LRT radar. If you've seen uh, the first starter fleet a review of the OSP, you'll see that there's also, this one's also in that. You design to point this, uh, coupled with the fact that it has two track correlators. I come down and find it. You have one of the better positional and velocity error type weapon um, type radars within the OSP faction. It also has a max range of 14k. You put this ship out the back somewhere, being able to look forward within a very narrow cone, identifying what you want, and that way you can use these four ships here to fire on that until you're able to get within that uh, six and a half kilometers to get that lock using the RF-44 pinpoint radar. In support, you've also got an uh, EO laser dazzler, which will scramble EO uh, signals coming in, effectively like an EO jammer. And you have the two P60s as well. This is sitting far enough back that um, you shouldn't be experiencing too many mass missile strikes uh, from the Alliance. However, um, it is a fairly weak point defense in terms of um, multiple targets. However, you do have some backup here in terms of missiles, uh, anti-missile missiles, I should say. You also have one restore and two repair teams, so any little hits from missiles. The main one that I do want to focus on is this ship. Uh, this is something that we haven't covered yet. It has the Bastion point defense turret, the Flak Gatling gun, and it's supported with um, one more of those and two of the 20 mils. Uh, so it's got fairly good point defense uh, sitting out the back, but the early warning radar is what we want to have a look at here. Now, this is the longest and widest early warning radar or search radar within the OSP. It has a max range of 18 kilometers. You can put this anywhere out the back as long as it can look through uh, and have line of sight. It can detect the enemy ships. Uh, its massive aperture size and its decent gain is also going to help. However, the downsides to this ship is the fact of its positional and velocity error. 
at 150 meters and 10 meters per second. This is not something that you want to be shooting at or using to shoot. What you want to be doing is putting this ship out the back somewhere and using its radar to sweep across the battlefield, identifying where ships are, and then using this ship here to use its Bloodhound radar to provide the best track for these four ships until such time that you're able to get the pinpoint radar onto target. This ship is also bolstered by two adaptive radar receivers, which will increase uh, sensitivity and lower noise filtering. At the same time, it's even going to make that positional error and the velocity error worse. However, considering it, it was already horrible to start with, uh, this is a very fair trade-off in order to get probably the best ability to spot anything within the game. When you deploy into the game, you're going to have your formation set up for your main force, which is the four ships in this rough pattern. Now, this is the testing range, so I have had to I quickly redo this, but it will be a little bit tighter um, when you actually deploy properly. Now, the first thing that I want to have a look at or I recommend you do is um, have the formation not as relative, but as true. I'll show you why. The relative formation means that anytime I move the heading, the roll, or give a movement order, all of these ships are going to need to remove around the central ship, and that costs time. So if I give a quick demonstration here, and I have sped up the time. You can see that each of these ships are going to take a long time. The, this one here will accelerate. This one's burning backwards. They're all going to rotate. And this is causing your ships that take a long time to bring their main weapons, these main frontal weapons, which will strip the armor off the enemy ships in order to give the T-30s their chance to do the damage. Not a lot of time to do it. So if I clear the heading and we run a scenario, if Task Force Oak pops up on my left-hand side, and I need to quickly rotate. I don't want all of these ships having to rotate around in order to bring their guns to bear. What I want to do is by, switch, by switching to true, and if you do this at the beginning, notice that you'll have your ships uh, orientate around and do a little bit of a movement. But once I see Task Force Oak approaching and I set my heading, each of these ships will now rotate. So instead of all of them having to rotate, they're going to rotate individually but in the same direction a lot quicker. And likewise, I can change the heading back. And they all rotate just that little bit faster, saving you a couple seconds, maybe getting a couple um, salvos off before or during their opening engagement instead of after. If you set the formation to true at the beginning, then you get the little switcheroo out of the way nice and early. And then as you move your ships around, you'll see that they all move. Still roughly within the same formation, but just a little bit um, on the side. Uh, one thing that I would also recommend that you do is, as you can see, this ship here is now blocking this ship here, um, offsetting this one by coming up a little bit or this one coming down a little bit. And that's maybe an edit uh, change that you need to do in the fleet editor. You can just do a formation adjustment with shift and F. Sorry, that took a while to get that thought out. So we've covered this one before, the Bloodhound, the R400. When you fire it on a track, it's going to be able to find exactly where it needs to be looking. So if I just turn off all these radars over here, when we then look with our R400 Bloodhound, and we have a look around, you can see that we'll now get the tracks for our other ships. However, sometimes in the expanse of space, you don't know exactly how to look, especially with this small little flashlight uh, out in the dark. And that's where this larger one comes in, the early warning radar. Roughly point it in a direction, it sort of doesn't matter where. Now the ship does need to rotate because it doesn't gimbal as well. All right, fun fact. I want to show you this, but um, I think I've discovered a bug. Um, what I'm trying to show you is the, the early warning radar. And you can see here, I'm just turn the pause the time down. You can see that the track inaccuracy is being picked up. However, what should be occurring, it should be something similar to the Bloodhound, is that a, instead of a tight blue cone, you should be looking at a large blue cone, looking fairly wide out to here and fairly wide out to there. It also then goes out to 14 kilometers. Now, this is, appears to be a bug maybe in testing range, but I've, I've obviously played with this in game and it worked fine. And we know that it's working because with the... Okay, it's not working. Anyway, look, 
early warning radar should be shooting this massive um, cone out there and that will detect these ships here which will then allow you to use this ship with the bloodhound to actually find and then queue up for these ships other than that there's not too much else that you really probably need to know about uh, in terms of starting off with this fleet just to give you a bit of a uh, demonstration of how it works what we're going to do is fire the plasma and HEHC and as we slow down you can see that there's a fair amount of fire that comes out of these ships we're aiming at the track on the left Here you can see the damage being affected. So not only is it a great uh, visual spectacle, if I just slow it down and pause it here, you can see where the armor is starting to be stripped and it'll bounce around. You can see that the front cone um, or front of the ship or the nose of the ship uh, has been damaged a fair amount. So all the, sh all the uh, HE that is being fired in there is now going to be um, passing through a little bit easier. You've got a formation, so you can do formation firing. If you hold down shift and then right click on the track, all of your ships will be grouped, all your weapons will be grouped, I should say, uh, in one thing. Here I can change all of the ammo from HE, HC to HE. And you can see if I then check all my ships, they all have switched to HE. And I can also then uh, fire them all in a group together. So the complexity of this fleet has been significantly reduced by the fact that you have just one ship to control and it controls the other three for you. You can see the value judgment has taken a little bit of damage, knocked out its radar. Over time, you can do a fair amount of damage to these. You can also split the fire up between the two targets if you so wish. So that's it for this video. It's fairly short and sharp. I think this is one of the simpler fleets that you can initially start to use. Um, I certainly had a bit of fun with it. I'll put a video up of it in the next couple of days of me actually having a playthrough with it. Uh, and you can see me actually come up against uh, two of the um, Axfords as well and the sort of the damage it did with supporting fleets there. Uh, if you have any questions about the starter fleet, please let me know. And that way I can try and answer them as best I can. All right. Thanks for watching and take care.